This is Bob Baker with Jazz Guitar Today, and I'm being joined by Steve Vai. And I don't, I'm going to tell you, man, I just, I so admire what the hell you've done, man. It's just, it's, it's so much, Bob. <laughs> it's crazy. It really is. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, we, we could probably talk for four or five days, and there is a documentary on you, you know, 30 year documentary of people want right. to go there. But there's so many different facets to what what you've done and who you are. First of all, I don't think there's anything that you can't play on the modern guitar as we know it. That's a myth. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna. You're you know you studied composition, mm -hmm. so you really know what you're doing, which is amazing. With all the transcribing you've done of, of I mean Frank's music was probably arguably the most complex of all the music of that era for certain you know for sure. I agree. I and you were, how old were you at the time, 18, 19? Well, I was 18 when I started transcribing for him and kind of getting paid, you know? Right, and yeah. Got $10 a page. <laughs> me about a day a page. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that's uh, that's pretty, I, I went to, you know, I went to music school and I know what transcription is. And I was transcribing stuff that's, you know, nowhere near as complicated as that. So you started doing that and then you went to work with Frank and, and all that. And so that informs that informs your playing, obviously. Um, yeah. You're you're a composer. I mean, just go out and listen to all the record, all the music that you've done. But in terms of um, you know, just what appears to us as you know, total mastery of the the physical instrument. So you're you're doing a whole lot of things. You incorporate technology, you know, pretty pretty much in your music. Talk to us a little bit about what it meant to be educated mm -hmm. as a musician and where you decided to go with that and, and why? Well, I think everybody um, has sort of a natural attraction to those things that are just interesting to them. You know, that, that's why we get uh, such great um, athletes or business people or artists. And I was very fortunate because um, when I was very young, like four years old, I, I remember kind of discovering music. And it mm -hmm. was just like I hit a keyboard and I realized, oh, I get it. I see, you know, this, these are the notes and they go higher that way and lower that way and you mix them up and you create everything that you hear musically. <laughs> and um, I, so that was like a little epiphany at the time. And then the second epiphany that came right at the same moment, basically, was, uh, and, and I, I can't really explain why some people um, have clarity on certain things. Maybe it's predisposition or something, but I, as soon as I kind of understood how it works, which was like that, I didn't know how to do it, but I just understood the concept of it. I was also flooded with the realization that the cre creation of, of musical tapestries is infinite. It's just infinite. And if you learn how to control the other, uh, you know, musicians, say in an orchestra, then you, you can just go to town, you know, you can <laughs> go nuts, you know, and, and, and the, the creative thing, it's just infinite. And I knew this back then. And um, <laughs> so that was like, you know, it was like finding a little pot of gold, you know, and it was like, okay, that's what I like, you know, and I just never look up, you know, it's just, and then when I, um, I, uh, um, I remember I started playing accordion, like all good, good Long Italian, Island, boys. Italian boys, you know, right, yeah. nine years old, and I kind of got a handle on more of the written note and I would just draw do I would just write 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 didn't know what I was writing you know and then finally when I started playing the accordion I was like oh okay I know I got it you know and um then uh my sister came home with Led Zeppelin <laughs> you know so before that when I was probably about six or so I my parents brought home West Side Story so you know you're influenced by the music that comes into the house by your parents and sure when I heard that, it just had everything, so much in it that I loved, you know, composition, historical melody, drama, uh, you know, these these fight scenes and all this kind of stuff, and uh, a great story, and I love theater, and I'm a ham, 
you know, I like <laughs> performing. So that really pushed my buttons and I could hear all of that orchestral music. I'm saying, yeah, I know how he's doing that. You know, I don't know how to do it, but I, I know. So then when I was uh, like 12, I discovered Led Zeppelin or le maybe 11 or 10. And that then was, it started this merging of a deep interest in rock music and composition. So then naturally, uh, when I heard Zappa when I was like 15, um, he was doing all that. So I was really attracted to his music. But the thing that I really had uh, going for me in high school, I, I was entering the seventh grade and there was this 12th grade music theory class taught by this guy, Bill Westcott. And I wanted to start taking it, you know, in seventh grade. And uh, I had to make a deal with, the, with, the, with them because they needed the orchestra in, in uh, my school. They needed a tuba play. So I thought, I'll tell you what, I'll play the tuba if you let me take this class. <laughs> it was a deal. And for, you know, I, I read that nowhere, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, there it is. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, yeah, so for like five years, what is it, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, six years, every day, Bill Westcott put me through the gauntlet, man. I mean, he taught me everything. I was composing, I was writing, I wrote my first orchestra score for the high school. So I really loved the process of composing. And I, I've done it through my whole life, but it's it's very difficult to get your music played if you're a rock and roll guitar player. But in early 2000, uh, uh, Coda Clue uh, from uh, Holland that worked at MPS had a lot of faith in me as a right. composer. And he organized through the Dutch government grants um, the Sound Theories Project. And once that got out, that you know, with the Metropole Orchestra, once mm -hmm. that got out, uh, I started getting offers from all sorts of orchestras to compose things. So it's, it's really great. You know, it's really funny. I, I saw some of that video. You know, I, thought, I actually was watching that, that video of you with, with the orchestra. And one of the questions I ask people usually at the end of the, uh, of the interview is, if you had, you know, all the money in the world, you know, you, 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 you had to spend it on a music project. You know, you, you, you couldn't take it home and buy another Ferrari or whatever it is that you, you do. But you had all the money in the world. You could have access to any musicians, whatever you, you know, whatever you want. What would be your dream project? And, I, and I'm sitting there and, and everybody says different things, but I'm sitting there thinking, and I'm watching you with that orchestra doing your thing, you know, and beautifully, by the way. And oh, by the way, you know, counting time with your with your, 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 your with your finger, you know, as you're, you're going, you're mm -hmm. kind of mini, mini conducting the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going, holy shit, he's 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 living that dream right there. I mean, that has to be yeah. a complete mind. You know what? I mean, amazing, it's amazing to see that. Well, yeah, it really was. You know, it, I have to tell you, you know, I, I've had challenges in life, like like everybody but they were never really in the music business yeah you know, all that stuff it just seemed like it just kept getting handed to me on a silver platter you know and uh, i mean i worked you know yeah. I, because i loved it so much and uh when that opportunity came to actually play with the symphony my music uh, the first time that was way back i've done it many many times since mm -hmm. it was oh, yeah. just glorious you know i mean there's certain yeah, you know, there's certain protocol you got to get a handle on when you're a guitar player and you're playing with an orchestra. And it took some time. You know, the first first few times it wasn't uh, the euphoria that I had hoped for, <laughs> you know, but uh, it eventually morphed into that, you know. It's 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 amazing. So did you uh, did you write all this, all the charts, all the score? Did you score that out yourself, you know, for the orchestra? Yeah, um, I um. For, for, for my whole life, I've composed by hand. Right. And I write the scores, and then you hand it off to a copyist. And they'd take right. it. In the old days, they would take it, and they'd actually have to copy it onto onion skin. Right. And then they'd make the parts. And this was incredibly time-consuming and expensive, and really expensive. You'd be shocked. So then uh, with the advent of uh, notational programs, you know, I, I jumped on the finale bandwagon when they first came out in the 80s. Mm -hmm. 
But the program, and I'm not great with programs, but if I focus, I, I can get pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, but this program finale in the beginning was just impossible. It was totally user unfriendly, and but it was very powerful if you knew how to use it. There was really nothing else that was as powerful. So I used it to check scores after I would send my handwritten scores out, you know, because you can hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of times I tried to compose directly into Finale, but it's just, it's like running through peanut butter <laughs> <laughs> until you get the hang of it. And the hang of it came from me because I would always then quit and just go and, and write because there's something <laughs> romantic, you know, about yeah. I just love the writing notes, you know. Yeah, sure. But inevitably, it, it, it I'd have to give it off to a you know a copyist, and I'd find tons and tons of mistakes, and then they would have to do the parts, and then the parts would come out, and I'd find mistakes, and then you're in rehearsals with an orchestra, and uh, you know you're wasting time on mistakes. So, from the last score that I did was a piece called "The Still Small Voice." interesting piece because I hold one note through the whole piece with a sustainer and for that one I decided to uh, it's about 20 minutes I decided to I decided to become a finale expert oh all right you know so I just and and you know you can do that if you decide right you know and I decided I said that's it I'm I'm, I'm whatever it takes you know and right. I jumped into it real deep called on a lot of friends you know and really what I discovered is it's all about creating quick keys. And then after I was doing it for a while, I saw the great advantage in it because with the computer, first of all, you can hear what you're composing and you can also do incredible things that would take you forever. You know, you could take a melody line and hit one button and it'll canonize or it'll do um, harmonizations, it'll do um, retrograde and invert, you could all sorts of things. And you could take big swaths of things and just transpose them and move them, copy and paste. So, and then I actually generated the parts too. It's not as fun in a sense because it, for me, uh, there's something nice about just writing music. Kind of like digital, you know, the advantages are just too great to bypass. So, right, right. You do everything to read. Let's talk that blow. Well, something just just to put some uh, emphasis on it, you know, you just got to you got to dig in and work hard, you know, I mean, well, that's, you have to yeah. you have to be you have to be interested. Yeah. If and you're you find interested, something you want to do, you can't you can't. Yeah, you, you, you got to yeah, if you're interested, it's not work. You know, right. It's, kind of like time evaporates well let's let's talk about the the guitar and the way that you um i mean you have so much facility you know you can you know play yet your melody is your melodies that you write that you compose and that you play even are very accessible you know i mean they're they're melodic let's call it that you know they're, they're, they're melodic they're not you know it's not it's not a lot of i mean when it's time to blow, I mean, when it's time to, to play, you know, the, the explosions, if you will, you know, obviously they're there. But man, you you play so melodically and so beautifully that, you know, um, is, is that something when you play melody, is that something you're doing like consciously? Are you are you thinking, I think this sounds pretty, therefore I'm going to play it? Or do you think um, what is your process there? Well, there's, there's various ways that I reach for melody, and I think people reach for melody. If you're actually sitting and writing a song, yeah, uh, you're, you're listening. The best melodies come when you're listening in your own um, sort of emotional center. You know, when you're right. listening for the melody, um, as opposed to just trying to find notes that work in the scale. Right, right. You know what I mean? No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Which is fine. You know, that's fine, but. I've discovered, for me at least, there's a different kind of a connection you have when you're not, the, the, the theory can work um, in the background, sort of right. academically and relatively unconsciously, but because of primary importance is what you're hearing in your head, what you're feeling and what you, so that's my favorite thing in writing a melody. I love doing that, you know, especially when you're doing orchestra stuff, because it's endless. Yeah. It just keeps going. So, um, when I solo, 
that's a different approach to finding the melody, sort of, not, not really, you know, it's, it's kind of the same. You gotta create an opening and um, listen. You have to be just hyper-present. And it's kind of an interesting space. I'm, I'm sure that any accomplished musician that you talk to does this, you know? When you're in that um, state of uh, presence when you're playing, and if you're a jazz player or whatever, maybe the theory is working in the background, but at the forefront is, is your inner ear leading your fingers. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and then for someone like myself, I'm also fascinated at times with, you know, just fast shreddy kind of playing, you know, yeah. so I'll, I'll throw some of that in and may, maybe some of it's not so melodic. It's more like finger memory, but it's fun, <laughs> but they, it always has to, it always has to resolve to uh, something that makes sense. Right. So I'm always listening for melody. And what I do a lot also is I create sentences, lyrical sentences in my head, mm -hmm. and I play them on the guitar during a solo. Right. And this is magnificent for finding melodies. Motifs. I hear motifs, you know, when you're... When you're... Well, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty spectacular, actually. And you do a lot of things. You do a lot of things that are interesting. You, you incorporate... Uh, let me, let me say, hopefully I'm going to say this, but you incorporate technology into your music in a way that is, uh, I think is very, very tasteful. I mean, you, you, have, you have created an instrument that's controlled by the electric guitar, but it's, it, but it's informed by so many other things, you know, which you use. I, I mean, I see you, you know, playing with feedback on the stage, moving from one position physically on the stage yeah. to the other position because obviously the, the the resonant frequency is going to change as you move and yeah. messing with that and having fun with that but um you know your your you know your use of electronics i, I was watching one of your rig rundowns and you know what the latest thing your use of electronics it's still it's 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 a musical instrument it's not a musical instrument with effects all over it i hear a cohesive instrument even though there are a lot of things going on there but there's an instrument, there's a voice that's been created. Technology um, can be, you know, it can be very colorful and helpful. Uh, I know for me, my basic guitar tone is a relatively simple rock and roll, kind of a high gain, delay, stereo delay. I, I like that, you know, yeah. um, very legato kind of a player. But... Um, Many times I've I've written pieces of music based on the sound that's coming out of the effect because if you have um, all sorts of harmonization, delayed mm -hmm. harmonies and stuff like that, uh, you you can create um, you know things that uh, mel melodic statements that work that are actually created by the technology. Yeah. And a lot of people are doing this. I mean, I, I picked that delay thing up, you know, where you just keep creating melodies on top of melodies with delays from Brian May. You know, he was a master at that. Who are your favorite people to listen to? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. My favorite people to listen to? Yeah, who are your favorite people, people to listen to? Oh, no, anybody. Just what do you like to listen to? Oh, okay. Um, well, my favorite artist is Tom Waits. Mm. Uh so if I was to just rip off the kind of stuff I would listen to, it, it's a smat smattering of contemporary guitar players just to kind of hear what's going on. And I see, I see some stuff that's very interesting to me, like with uh, Tosin Abbasi, Animals as Leaders, and mm -hmm. guys like Polyphia. And um, these artists that are not only kind of transforming the technical abilities of the instrument, but doing interesting melodic things so many mm -hmm. times i see players that can you know they have incredible uh technique but it's that you know the the melodic and harmonic aspect of it is relatively um old you know what i right. mean it's it's in a sense it's it, it follows patterns and stuff but uh occasionally you get these guys that they take time you know the mm -hmm. timing the tempo the meter the um, uh, the harmonic dynamics, the 
technical ability and they just bring it someplace else and i love stuff like that but then there's classical music uh, i don't really listen to much classical old classical i like contemporary so guys like um L ligeti and stravinsky and uh berio um carter uh there's so many you know that that I'll go to listen to for that kind of stimulation. So I'll, I'll listen to different genres uh, if I find something inspiring, but usually I don't go any place without my entire Alan Holdsworth catalog. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Waits, Frank Zappa, Led Zeppelin, and Stravinsky. I mean, that's really... Now that's, that's, a, that's a cool group. And Tom Waits, of course. Yeah, Tom Waits. That is a, uh, you know what, I, I that could be a headline right there. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and man, you you love this, don't you? You you are you are in love with your gig, aren't you? I am very much. Yeah, I, I live a charmed life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really do, and it shows. I mean, I mean, you're out right now for over fifty dates, I believe. Yeah, I think you're 15 or 15 or 16 dates, something like that, into into this tour. Mm -hmm. I'm and, in uh, uh, Clearwater, Florida, right now, and I got yeah. to tonight. Yeah, and you're going to be all. You're still going to be all over the place. I actually have, uh, you know, the 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 tour dates. If they want to know where you're going to be, by the way, they can go to your website, which is easy. You just go um, Steve Vai on Google, and it's and a your long web tour. It's a yeah. long tour, man. You're out what three yeah. months, but you're three months and with very well, little no, time. This part, this part is a piece of cake. I yeah, mean, I'm going to be out until mid 24. That's a long freaking tour. Long time. We got uh, we did Europe. We did about 50 shows in Europe, and then I I went to Europe again, and I did a uh, recorded the Tampa Day Philharmonic 90 piece wow. orchestra, which of uh, really dense compositions I had written. And then um, uh, I went to South America to do Rock and Rio with Living Color. And uh, then we have, now we have this tour. It's about 50 to 55 shows. Yeah, I think it's like 50 something tour. Yeah, for this for this uh, tour. And then right after this, well, after this, I get a little break. I get a month, month off. And then starting next year, February, I'm in uh, South America and Mexico. And then right to Europe, Eastern Europe for another 50 shows. And then... I have a show with the Metropole Orchestra in May. And then right after that, directly after that, I have another American tour of 50 or so shows. And then right after that, it's um, it's the summer and probably Generation X, uh, if we can pull that together in the yeah. summer for Europe. And then it's all of like Australia, Asia, Indonesia, all, all of Africa, India. And then uh, that brings me to the end of 23. Mm -hmm. And then in the beginning of 24, the second uh, February of 24, it looks as though we'll be doing a G3 reunion with oh, John wow. Eric Johnson, you know? Yeah. We're, we're looking to do that. And then there's something that might happen after that, but I, I can't really, it's not confirmed, so I can discuss. But then I'm done with these gigantic world tours I, I'm like blown away, man. That that's uh, God, man. More power to you. That's incredible. It, it really that Thank that you. really is incredible. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't even know where to go with that, to be honest with you, because I'm, I was sitting there impressed with you know fifty a fifty uh, fifty show tour, and, and that's just the beginning, man. So, and you run a record label. Well, the record label is kind of in the back seat in a sense. Mm -hmm. I ran it for many years, like yeah. Uh, 15 years and you know when the mu music industry started to become real real challenging I, I had to make a decision so i have the catalog mm -hmm. and i um, handed it off to a management label a mascot fantastic label in holland and they just do all the day-to-day -day and they they uh distribute the catalog uh and i release my stuff through it yeah. so like in Violet, came out through favored nations mascot very, very cool. What would you like people to know about you? No. Um, okay, well, um, if you're not really interested in instrumental guitar music, <laughs> you may very much still enjoy the show. Right. 
There's a lot of Peter there. I'll answer any question. I mean, anything. Yeah, I mean, no, there's there's, there's but, a lot of Peter what I, there. What I want people to know about me, I don't care, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so concerned. No, no, no. You definitely got it. You got it going on. Well, I got to tell you, man, um, I, I, the, the, I don't, I can't think of anybody that impresses me so much in terms of, you know, the, what you've what you've done with the instrument itself you know the fact you, that you study the transcription the composition the 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 inquisitiveness and the creativity combined to do the things that you've done with the music the things that you've done with the technology how you incorporate that and then how you present your music you know you've got a theatrical approach to your you know to your presentation if you will live um and the music you know the music stands up recorded I mean, you know, there's a lot of shows that look great and they're very exciting and all that, but you go by the record and you go, oh, I want so much. And of course, right. we, we we know people that that make great music, but the live show is a little bit slow, you know? I mean, Alan is a good example of that. You know, you have to be Alan Holsworth. You know, Alan was Alan. Was Alan. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I mean, just truly amazing. I got a great picture of me and him holding the Guinness together, by the way, at the Hilton Bar, you know, ah, from, yeah, from, yeah. The, from the NAMM show. Yeah, he loved that. Oh, man, yeah. But um, but he, he was not, I mean, the this, this show was, I mean, he wasn't a, a he wasn't concerned about the theater, you know, the show of it. He just. No, not at all. When you go to an Alan Holdsworth concert, you yeah. are, it's like a meditation on his melodic ideas. Right. And, breathtaking ability to execute them uh, un, un, unbelievable i mean I, I still can't figure out how he did have that stuff but um but but you've got the whole you got the presentation thing together you incorporate technology beautifully it's a seamless as far as i'm concerned you you do all kinds of creative things with the instrument you, you're completely wide open i think you try anything and you seem to pull it off well you know? i can only i can only do things that um i can see myself doing Right. You know, it's like I said, there's this myth that I can play anything. That's just so untrue, man. You know, well, I mean, that's because uh, you're you uh, and you know what, you know, but well, I, I know like um, something like uh, on the new record, there's a, a song called Candle Power. Mm -hmm. So I had to it, it was very outside of my comfort zone, but I, I wanted to do I saw it and it involved things that for many people are very easy, like using their fingers I never right. really, you know very clean tone stratty and it had these techniques in it for uh, no whammy bar no delay nothing you know and i had this idea for these this technique of bending notes in different directions <laughs> and you know and i call it joint shifting yeah so I, I was able to do that because i saw it in my mind you know um and something like teeth of the hydra on the new record in Violet. Um, have you seen that? I, I have not, I'm sorry. Well, you'll have to see the video for it because I'm playing oh, this oh, three neck. Oh, oh no, 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 oh, no, no, that video. I'm sorry, no, no, yes, I have seen that video. Yes, I absolutely yeah, positive because you got the bass, you're hitting the bass note, you know, you're doing yeah. things with the bass note and then you got a, you got a guitar that's fretted halfway up and the bass, you know, I mean, yeah. and, and then you got, yeah, yeah no. It's, very, it's, it's kind of a nice song, you know, and- It's a, uh, it's a great piece of music. Thank you. And and the thing is, um, if if a person looks at that, if a guitar player looks at that, uh, it just looks so impossible. You know, it's like what what are you, what is he do? What are you doing? How can you do that? But really, it, it it's not because um, it, 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 the things that seem impossible don't seem so impossible once you start doing them. Right. And I I had a vision for it. So anybody that can play mo most most relatively accomplished guitar players that i know could play that piece mm -hmm. you know because um it's not different the thing that's difficult is the um independence you right know? and that just takes work it just takes time well so conceiving of it like that, well that's that's the uh, the compositional element that's that, the, that piece of music it's composition Right. Yeah. That's the, well, that's the art. The, the art at that point is you can, you, you conceived of that piece of music, which is you, it's all you. I mean, everybody's got a blank, blank canvas. Some people are better with what they do with the blank canvas, but if you can't conceive of the Mona Lisa, you're not going to paint it. 
So, I mean, you, exactly. you know, so you, you conceived of this piece and that that's, that's what makes it totally uniquely you now, can you bring it to life? You know, that's the second part of it, which is, you know, can I technically do this thing that I can con have conceived of? And so, exactly. and so you, because you're physically not constrained. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm going to say this in, 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 a, in a way, I mean, I know you're, you're thinking about shit you can't do, but you know, you're, you're to, to most people, you're physically not constrained at all. So it's, it's sort of like whatever you can think you can play or you can work towards playing it. And and that's, that's how it comes across. So the I art, <laughs> well, it's smoke, well I, I would like to say smoke and mirrors, but you know, it's not smoke and mirrors because you do pull off a lot of stuff. I mean, but the thing is, if, nice. if, if, if you didn't see your own, your own, boundaries that you need to smash through then you'd be done and that wouldn't be fun for you you know you'd be you know you'd be playing the same old shit over and over you know like a lot of people do unfortunately but i mean you know you know where your challenges are and what you have to do to break through those challenges but the fact that you have broken through challenges year after year after year after year after year, and you've brought those challenges to a very, very, from a human point of view, what can a human being do? Because you don't have six arms. You know, from a, from a human being point of view, you've brought it to a pretty freaking high place. Come on, man. I mean, you are, you know, you are who you are. And um, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Well, thank you. I, I think uh, the, the thing that um, is re re relatively similar in me than most people that just continue to do that is that they find just an interest, like you get an idea right. for something. It's just like, I don't know where it, you know, it comes from the vast pool of, uh, you know, creativity that exists in all of us. And uh, for me, I might make plans. I might say I'm gonna. I want to do this, or I'd, I'd like to try this. Whatever. But then, when something arises that uh, is really compelling, you, you, it becomes the boss. You right. Know? And you almost you almost <laughs> become like catatonic with must do now. You know, must right. do. <laughs> and then, um, and a lot of times it involves something that's just a little outside of your ability, you know, and, right. and if you project, if you can create an, a visual of yourself doing something that's just a little bit outside of your ability, right. then, then there's a, an excitement and enthusiasm with the path to get there, you know? Right. And, and, and I have to tell you, Bob, um, for me, uh, it, it, it was always kind of about that, you know, from the very beginning, it was chasing fun, interesting, enthusiastic ideas. And through the years, there was, you know, I, I took different turns. I was, I, I, I was bamboozled by money at times and mm. fame or things like that, you know, or big gigs or stuff like that. But still, um, the, the things that were most rewarding with those ideas that co they come to you and they, they're they equipped with an aha moment and enthusiasm. And you know what I mean. You, oh, yeah, absolutely. You get, you, you get a whole a whole download for something and you go, oh, <laughs> I, I got to write that, that down. Just, yeah. I got to write that, that down. That was the boss, right? I, I got to get it done. To it. Yeah. I, 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 I understand. I, believe me, I do understand it. Do you ever think, do you think about keys and scales and shit like that? It's based on what I'm doing and what's, what is going on around me. Mm -hmm. um, I, it works in the background. Mm -hmm. Like if I hear an A minor chord, I, I just, you know, I, I know where it is, you know, right. but if, if there's changes and I'm, I only have my ear, then you have to switch gears and 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 you know switch to your ears but right. even when you're uh, even when you're navigating in one key or right. one scale um you know there's certain times in my past and even now where i'll use you know kind of like scales uh 
as they are, you know, right. fast things like that. But really, for me, a scale is a it's a flavor. You know, they, every scale has a personality to it, mm-hmm. and it's chords that it belongs to. You know, so um, based on the situation, okay. So on the new record, there's a song called "Little Pretty." Mm-hmm. And this song is a beast because the chords are, are, are pretty adult chords, you know. And the solo, I decided, so this was where you asked me if I think scales or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I decided I wanted to create a solo section that had this repetitive chord pattern where every, every chord, when it changes, is completely different, alien to the previous chord right but somehow it works you know um so and they go by pretty quick it's kind of like jazz you know mm-hmm. so when when if i hand these chords off to a jazz player they'll um i mean to a particular type of right. jazz I, I and they look look at the chords and go okay the, the, like this scale works there and that scale works because you have to because they're all hybrid uh, uh, synthetic scales right nothing really works normally you know right and um so you learn the scale and then when the chord comes by you know the the, the knee-jerk reaction is to play the notes in the scale that work you know up and down the scale or you know so that's what i really try to avoid and if you listen to the solo in little pretty it's it's a composition you know because first of all i can't improvise over those chords in real time i don't know many who can <laughs> but um <laughs> you're so admitting I, it <laughs> I, I, oh yeah no they're big boy chords yeah. you know and, yeah. and um I'm sure there's great you know players that just can hear you know and right. do it but um you know so i constructed a solo uh that's just like a melody through the right. whole thing so that was a uh an instance where the theory and the scales and things like that played a big part but ultimately it can't sound that way right right for no, me, I, I, yeah i get no no i'm I, I, right I totally agree. yeah it, it's yeah. got it's got to sound musical and sounds, that. yeah it sounds intellectual it, yeah it's got to sound musical and not academic it can't be academic. Uh, I think that writing academically or conceptually, uh, it, it, there's a period of time when that's very helpful because you're, you're learning and stuff. And there's aspects of that that can work in the background. But ultimately, if you want to know who you are right. musically, you, you have to create a space for that. And it has, it, it's in there. It is there. But it's actually a, a shift in focus right. from the safety of knowing what you're doing to the openness of listening and re- and responding. That's a great answer. You know? Yeah, that's a great answer. That really is. You know, um, Eric Johnson, your colleague and friend and peer and all that kind of stuff. When, when I talked to him about this a little bit, we were talking about how much of his show was improvised, how much of his show was, is, you know, composed, of, you know, his, his, his improvisations, his solos, if you will. Mm-hmm. And he said something, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, I, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to keep it honest. He said, well, he said, truth be known, probably about 65% of it is stuff that I've kind of played before in some way or another, but I might stitch it together a little bit differently. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling from licks that I've played before, but I may not have, you know, and then 35 or whatever the number was, you know, percent of it is just totally, I'm out there, you know, I'm, you mm-hmm. know, I, I'm, I'm having a faith in myself that no matter how far crazy out I go, I can get back, you know, mm-hmm. but, but, you know, that was kind of his answer to how much of his soloing, if you will, is is improvised versus how much of it is is composed. Yeah. Do you think about those kinds of things? Do you, do you think about, you know, how much of your soloing is something that's like the same every night or how much of it is just, you know, you ever think about well, where you're at with yeah. that? I would yeah. say that um, it's according to the gig, but my shows, mm-hmm. there's more than 60% that's repetitive. Uh, because it's a lot of it's melody mm-hmm. uh, songs and melody and that stuff uh, I don't change right. that because no no those are those are that's the melody that's the song yeah. yeah but I'd say probably thirty percent of the show or so is just uh, twenty thirty percent is you know improv yeah. but, but... and uh, 
I think that yeah. that's fair. Um, so just a couple more things, if you don't mind. So I know that, you know, you, you've, you've got a million guitars out with you. You know, you've got your signature instrument that you've been playing for a long, long time. And but I'm seeing, you know, you're you've got some semi hollow guitars and then you got a video at home. Where you're playing a big Ibanez uh, uh, fat body yeah. guitar. And that's just, you know, yeah, yeah, that's um, a little pretty. I um, I recorded that one with. Uh, um, well, I have a, a John Schofield with me. Yeah, no, I saw that. Yeah. Because uh, it's the only, uh, I went through so many guitars to find the right one to play that song live because it needed a semi-hollow for the, yeah. the space the, the space it creates around the notes. And uh, that was the only one that I could find that I could play and that also didn't feed back like mad. That's a, those are great guitars. They're you know, Great guitars. Yeah, those, they're great guitars. guitars. And, and John... Uh, I was going to tell you, so I'm, I'm just, this is a compliment. And uh, so I was, I interviewed Robin Ford the other day and um, he's been in, in here about four times, I guess. And anyway, wow. and uh, he was talking about his playing. I love Robin's playing. I mean, I, I think he's, I just, I love his playing. Different school. It's just, play. Yeah. He said yeah. to me, it's just, so it just, this is, this is fun for you. He said to me, he said, well, you know, I'm no Steve Vai. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, no that, is, what he's talking about. that is a quote you can go on go to jazzguitartoday.com like i'm embarrassed and see <laughs> and see robin's robin's interview and uh it's it was we just put it out like last week he said he said you know like, i'm no steve Vai. you know i got my thing you know but i'm no steve Vai, and i i, I cracked up i <laughs> he can well, lose me on the table man he's 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 got that down man he's a boy man his tone is phrasing. oh yeah i love robin nation oh god you know I, I love i love robin i think he's uh i think he's and he's i was telling him the other he's he's happy he moved oh, to paris cool. he's in he's in paris he moved from from ojai to nashville to paris and he's he's loving being there and he's having a great time anyway oh, well, listen, man, you've been so generous and so kind to come on. Um, right, this thank is, you know, so Bob, much, Bob. You're welcome. The Bob Baker with Steve Vai for Jazz Guitar Today. Thanks a lot, Steve. I really appreciate it, man. God bless you, brother. Thank you. You too, brother, man. Bye-bye.